Welcome to the fourth and last part of our talk about uh, developing emergency plans. One tool I'd like to introduce to, to you is a self-assessment tool. It's actually a uh, tool I use at, at work and I think it's uh, very useful to give us an overall understanding of the situation where we are, gives us different considerations so we can proceed in a uh, uh, schematic matter. The first one, the worst topic or remit is Doctrine Plus. I'm looking at uh, what is the legal framework, what are, uh, is the, uh, do we have guidelines, um, best practices in our sector, what kind of powers we have, we have what sort of limitations. From an organizational point Point of view, how are we structured as an organization? How complex are we? At which level do we find ourselves? You know, what is on top of us below uh, at the same level? Are we more a formal or informal organization? From an education and training perspective, what uh, initiatives are we taking on the individual training, on collective training within our institution, and what sort of exercises can we actually conduct with external actors to actually test our plans and keep us ready and fit for purpose? From a leadership, uh, sorry, um, a material perspective, perspective, what are the what is my inventory? What kind of items am I responsible for? Is it pictures, is it small coins, or is it huge and very heavy statues? What is the security and safety situation? What kind of alarm systems do we have? Um, how secure um, can my, my pieces be? Transportation, are we... Um, do, do we have our own transportation systems or are we rely on others and contractors from the communication um, equipment? Do we have diversified and redundant um, networks? How long can we actually last should the power go off? We'll look at leadership. What kind of qualities are we looking for in our leaders? What responsibility do they have? What are their powers, their authorities? What are the limitations, sometimes more important than the others? In terms of personnel, what is the expertise and the experience of my personnel? Uh, what kind of interaction do, are they having normally? What is the working environment? Are we fostering an environment that actually uh, creates this, this feeling of a team and everybody's willing and able, looking to actually contribute also in kind, in kind of uh, emergencies? From a uh, facilities perspective, how secure are our facilities, our museum? How are there any vulnerabilities that we need to address? Is my collection all in one uh, location or actually we have uh, other uh, site deposits at other locations, possibly at uh, long distance, which complicates everything, especially in case of emergency. If you're looking at information, there is probably two aspects. One is the data aspect. So how do we collect our data? How do we save it? How do we keep it available? I already mentioned having a uh, hard uh, copy of our folder with, with our plan and also having digital copies that are easier to transmit. And the second aspect of information is the messaging also on social media, how are we present, what kind of perceptions do outsiders have, how are we promoting the image of our institution. The last one is interoperability. So what level of interaction do we have with other uh, actors, stakeholders outside? Are we mutually supporting each other? Are we part of a network with whom we work and train together? And networking is the next point or major point that I'm going to address. Let me tell you that networking is a must. You can just not do it alone. Protection culture property is, even if it's just one piece, so complex, so much information that you need, legal problems and whatnot, that sometimes it's just best to uh, involve ourselves and, and look for external partners uh, to actually mutually support each other. Well, we have seen a list of our internal resources. Now, with whom are they interacting and how can we improve that interaction so we have a better performance? And obviously, the same thing can be said with the external resources. Obviously, more can be added and 
um, but the same thing is actually valid here. How can we improve the interaction? So in case of emergency, the performance is the best possible. One sort of actor we cannot overlook is uh, emergency services, particularly fire department, and not only in emergency situations. Uh, some of them are endowed with spectacular uh, equipment like this uh, um, information and coordination center. This is how it looks inside. They have all sorts of, of uh, networks and links uh, giving possibility to actually exchange information and keep uh, functioning even in the worst conditions. One actor I always invite to contact is law, law enforcement, specifically at the, at the local level, because they are actually out there every day. So they might be interested, have a vested interest in knowing our institution, potential situations that could be of interest for, for, their, for their professional perspective. But obviously for us, it is important to actually get to know each other, to invite them to our location, present the situation and maybe ask them even for counsel how to improve our situation. Another actor that we should not discount and very often heritage community is not very eager to contact is, is the military. We said have uh, personnel, so have human resources, they have logistical resources and they have the, the ability to, uh, to move and operate even in the worst conditions. Now allow me to share some very synthetic points in the notes. There is all the points that Dr. Lori Rush actually developed in a lifetime war as a working as a civilian within military structure in cultural property protection. And he said the first thing that we should do is never waste their time. And that definitely goes for emergency actors as well. Consider that we might have only one chance to make our case. So you need to be very concise and go straight to the point, make, an, make them understand what, what we want from them. Uh, offer them information to save life and to contribute to mission success. A mission success for them could also be show that the military is actively involved in protection culture property in uh, helping out the local museum, also participating in exercises try to learn about and learn about their culture, about their education, their training methods, why they operate in, in specific ways in order to be uh, the best possible, to, to actually enjoy the best possible um, interaction. We have spoken obviously of civil protection, also a, a key actor, especially in um, disasters. Then there are some NGOs like SOS Archivi, who give, uh, allow us to improve our knowledge, our skills, and even work hand on, on situation during trainings. Very important uh, and key is the media to actually improve our standing with the community to get information out there, what we are doing, that we are involved, that we are trying to improve our situation and to actually keep our, our cultural heritage safe. Some of the tips uh, for during and after the emergency, particularly from a networking perspective, once the emergency actually hit, what could we actually think of? Well, where is the information exchange and where is it coordinated? Who participates in these locations? Do you know these people already? Do you have access to them? Who do you need to reach in a case of an emergency? How would you do that? How do you communicate? Do you even have power? What do you need to actually keep your collection safe? On the other hand, what can your institution offer to other stakeholders and people outside in your community? When is it going to happen? Yeah, do you already have warnings that a situation might develop? For how long is it going to last? For how long can you actually hold out? Always keep in touch and updated. So exchange information constantly. After the emergency, a couple of ideas evaluate and improve. So what went well during 
the emergency, but also during the training, or what worked out, what were these best practices. On the other hand, what did not work out so well, analyze those, those factors, and then try to find remedial actions, so the next time you're better prepared. And then thank those who actually gave you a helping hand. And don't, uh, don't forget to actually reach out also to those who did not help. Maybe there was some misunderstanding. You actually can use this, this emergency that passed as a stepping stone on which to actually build a better comprehension and build a rapport for the future. If you are looking at recapping our resources, I gave you some ideas about how to do a self-assessment. I told you that it is necessary and we need to have a network because alone it is very, very difficult to actually be successful. You have some ideas on how to consider this networking aspect before the emergency and also during the emergency and also after the emergency. We take the time now to recap the whole talk that we had today. Well, I hope that I convinced you that a plan is needed and I gave you enough information to actually start thinking how to actually go about creating and developing one. The most important point is definitely to take action and to decide to actually take action. And then after afterwards, everything slowly, slowly can come together. You need to assess the situation, what is available, what are the problems, what are the gaps and how you're gonna fill those gaps. Um, we spoke of some ideas how to find the resources. There's actually a lot of information out there. Uh, you need to be able to actually reach out and collect it. Then uh, we looked at how to develop a plan, what more or less should be contained in an emergency plan. We spoke of the importance of a network in order to actually mutually support each other. Obviously, it is important to implement and test our plan so we can see what works and what does not work very well. And then we can look at improving on those uh, on the shortcomings and then we start from anew. And if we conclude now with the closing word, plan. Thank you very much.